Welcome to the first episode of Between Two Layers. I'm Carly Riley. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. This is the first in at least a four-part series, really looking at what's happening in the Layer 2 ecosystem and breaking down what's going on at Immutable X in particular. I was drawn to this project because if you believe in Ethereum, you have to understand what's happening on Layer 2s. So this is really a foundational episode. It'll lay the, the groundwork of what's happening in L2s right now. We'll get a little technical, like modular versus monolithic blockchain theory. If you don't know what that is, you really need to understand what that is and what you're making a bet on. We'll talk about IMX's business model, what you think for the future predictions, um, and have some fun. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna start just asking you some questions because yep. you're the expert here and I'm the noob who is just very interested in layer twos. Something that I think is so fascinating about you is you came at this as a game developer. So most of us probably know that Ethereum isn't scalable at this point and that if we wanna be trading thousands of NFTs a day, it's not gonna happen on Ethereum layer one. You built Gods Unchained, how many years ago now? Uh, it came out in 2018, mid 2018. Like, damn. And you realized in doing that, it wasn't going to work on a, on Ethereum layer one. And so instead of being like, hey, I'm going to go build this on another chain or another L2, you decided to build your own L2. Why did you go that route as opposed to just putting your game somewhere else? I think it was a confluence of factors. The first was we knew what we never would compromise on. And mm. that was A, security. I never wanted to be in a position where I could wake up and have lost users billions of dollars of assets. And the whole point was to build infrastructure that could support the largest games and the largest applications in the world. So we're talking about literally like hundreds of billions of dollars in value pretty quickly. And to have that on something which was not fundamentally secure was unacceptable to us. But then the second thing is you don't want to trade off liquidity or network effects or the ecosystem. And so pretty clear to us early on was that Ethereum would be the best place to build. The question was then just how. And I think the reason a lot of alternative companies went off and built their own chains is that was a very popular VC thesis back in the day, was that was how you would build the most uh, value accretive product or, or the product that could be most successful. And ETH competitors as an idea back then was actually you know, very, very popular um, because we hadn't seen the sort of huge benefits that network effects would bring uh, that we do today. And we basically looked at every solution under the sun. Um, so for a bit of context, when we launched one of our major sales for Gods Unchained, it was the same time that Fcoin launched. And if you remember... I don't even remember this. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. So they're, they're, they're not, you know, they're not super popular as an exchange anymore, but they incentivized early adoption by having a uh, GUI incentive attack, which was basically they, they ran up gas on the network. And so for the first time ever, GUI went from three, which is what it had been averaging for the past you know, year, to above 100. And they were called Fcoin. They were called Fcoin. Uh -huh. okay. um, and this was their idea of a PR uh, marketing stunt, which did generate a lot of buzz, and but not in the right way uh, for them, I think. And in the end, the packs that we were selling went from having a gas cost of, say, 50 cents to sell a $2.50 pack to you know, above 10, 20, 30 dollars. So clearly the unit economics were crazy. And we had to work out a solution back then. Uh, in, in that instance, we invented sort of a deferred minting, which is, you know, used today by, by many different um, sort of applications and, and marketplaces. But what we knew was that fundamentally this was an optimization, not a solution. And we looked at pretty much everything from Plasma um, if you recall the, the early efforts into Plasma, which... I'm later to this scene, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, so so th there were some ideas around um, Plasma chains early on that never really um, worked out. We looked at state channels, um, which kind of proved for, for multiple reasons not uh, particularly viable. We had a, a sort of a full MVP built. Um, we looked into side chains, obviously, and rolled them out fairly quickly because they're basically just like a separate L1 with a bridge to whatever they claim to be a sidechain for. Um, and then we also looked at optimistic rollups, which were actually around a little bit earlier than CK rollups. And while it's fantastic technology, they don't really work for NFTs. Um, and the reason is because of the withdrawal times, which take about a week. You can get around them with market making. If you have fundable tokens, if they're unique tokens, then you know I'm not going to wait a week to withdraw my one of a kind skin or sword or financial asset which is an NFT, but I also can't market make it or loan you the identical kind because it's a unique uh, asset. 
um, and also the cost base of, of uh, ORUs is significantly higher than CKRs. Um, and so we actually serendipitously um, found out about Starkware quite early on and the works that they were doing in, in CK rollups. And we basically realized that this was going to work. Um, so we did make a bet uh, pretty early on on ZK technology. It was not clear that it would be viable um, for the long term. I'm very happy we made that bet now. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that no matter what chain wins, my belief it's going to be Ethereum, but I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not sort of militant about that. I'm, I'm open to the ideas of a multi-chain future, but I very, very strongly believe that it has to be a modular architecture. It will be ZK rollups on whatever is successful. Um, so that was sort of why we decided to, to pursue this approach. Um, and I think that the reasons that we chose it now have, have really lasted in terms of the technical choices today. We've seen, you know, literally billions of dollars in bridge hacks over the past six months. We've seen the impact that a lack of network effects or liquidity for siloed you know, app chains or Ethereum competitors have, and the level of difficulty that these, these blockchains are actually having in developing uh, either true decentralization at a sort of governance or, or consensus mechanism uh, policy, or just the security that enables them to succeed. So I feel very validated in the choices that we made back then. There's still a lot to do, but I think you know the, the, the next few years are going to be the years of L2 and L3. What I heard you get at in, in that last answer is what was really popular at the time and popular to VCs was what like Axie Infinity did, what Dapper Labs did, who had CryptoKitties, and it's to build a totally separate chain, right? Which is Ronin in the case of Axie or yeah. Flow in the case of Dapper. And y'all seem to have presciently picked up on the fact that you were going to lose the Ethereum network effects and that that was a huge loss because Ethereum was actually where a lot of the energy was. To us, like, the most important thing is how do you create the best platform for people to create businesses? And that means it has to be watertight secure. And none of those alternatives are. Like we've seen literally billions stolen over the past six months alone. Um, it meant it had to have the default network effects of the biggest platform in the world. There is no point competing with that. Um, so we knew we wanted to live on Ethereum. We were happy to compromise if that meant we'd have a slightly less attractive pitch to VCs. Turns out, I think it's a much more attractive pitch. Um, and we're definitely going to see a, a huge amount of um, narrative and attention being driven to L2s over the next year. So what's so interesting is you made this bet that to go on to Starkware yep. back in 2018. And for folks who maybe aren't super aware of this, there's optimistic rollups, there's ZK rollups. You alluded to optimistic rollups a bit. They're more common among DeFi, Arbitrum, Optimism. Yep. OK. Were there ZK rollup L2s when you made this decision, or were you really pioneering that? Not many. I, I think, you know, Starkware was basically one of the first that had production grade, zero knowledge rollups ready. And of course, by the end of this year, we're going to have full Solidity compatibility. So the last remaining differential why you would choose anything else uh, will go. And it will be, in my opinion, uh, ZK maxis all the way. Let's talk about the L2 landscape a little bit more broadly. And, and I might add actually on that, like none of the stuff that I just said, any game developer cares about. The only thing they care about is what do they understand by you saying security? And the only thing they, they literally notice is if you point to, hey, $600 million bridge hack, another $600 million bridge hack, you know, both Ronin and Poly Network. Uh, you know, we have terror collapsing. That's the stuff that makes them realize the consequences of this. And that's why it's so important that when we go to market, we establish dominance with a secure solution because otherwise, people end up building on something that they're not going to do deep due diligence on. Like I could less than 10% of customers actually go into the details of how is this stuff constructed. The majority of them are going off, you know, wh where the wind blows, social proof, and where they think they'll have the most success. Security is only a concern when it goes wrong. So this is so interesting. And I, I think we we risk getting, we risk losing people by getting so technical when you get into the security piece. But I do think it's it's really important because it also ties into like modular blockchain theory stuff. Yeah. So can you explain to folks, let's talk about side chains, for example, Polygon being a one of the most famous, probably best known side chain, but, but there are others, Ronin sort of has a side yeah. bridge to Ethereum. Why is that less safe? What is the difference between that and how that's working versus an L2? Oh, look, all the sidechain is is basically a layer one blockchain with a bridge to Ethereum. Or, you know, you could have a Tron sidechain. There's no reason why you can't. And the, that means there's actually no inheritance of security whatsoever. You're literally relying on those nodes, uh, that consensus mechanism, that amount of 
you know, staking or mining power of wh whatever is securing that network. Um, and in the cases of, of some of the ones you mentioned, you know, you're, you're actually requiring like 10 multi-sigs, where if seven or more of them decide, they can just steal over half of the funds in the entire network. So, um, it's like copy paste, right? Like a side chain basically works as like where I'm like, hey, we're gonna yeah. take this transaction and we're gonna kind of copy it and we can like paste it into the Ethereum. Copy paste network. in wingdings, like copy paste um, in what? Copy paste, but in wingdings, like nothing wingdings. really. Like you don't have the same resources behind mm. the the new, new version. You don't have um, the miners. You don't have the economic bandwidth. You don't have the level of decentralization of people having installed like Geth client and and running it. You know, or running their own nodes. So at pretty much every level, it is inferior. Obviously, you can just tweak and say, cool, like security down, scale up, and suddenly you can claim you have thousands of TPS. The reason I. I I tend to trust you, <laughs> and, I, and I do understand this, I think, a, a bit more than probably your, your average person, frankly, even in this space, because I've spent a lot of time listening to, to people talk about it and bank lists and, and all the rest of it. But what's so interesting is I think you come from a dev background, right? Like, and you literally thought about this from the, the perspective of your own game that you were trying to build and like, you know, as a developer. Uh, and so I think you come by it like very authentically. I'm curious for you, like, how is that transition from building a game and and being very sort of I imagine heads down doing developing yeah. work to being a co-founder and and yeah, co-CEO it's, it's, of 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 the yeah company. exactly um, it's nuts um, but I guess when you space it out over like four and a half years or, or nearly five we've been running at it you get a lot of chances to learn what you have to do next and I'd say you have a completely different role from one to twenty people to. 20 to 60 people to like 60 to 300 people where we are today. Um, and each requires learning what are the new things I have to get really good at. Um, obviously, I haven't programmed in a while. Uh, and, you know, I thank God for that. But um, what you do have to get good at is what are the decisions and types of activities that now have leverage at this new level of scale? Um, all while maintaining these principles around sort of how do we build toward a better future for, for players and, and users of blockchain? Um, and I think that is that's what makes it fun. Like honestly, being mission driven, working on something that is, um, you know, I, I wake up and I'm like, this is one of the coolest things we could possibly be doing. Um, and that fills us with, I think, a lot of energy and the the willingness to just constantly say, cool, like how do we get to the next level as a company and, and sort of bring this to more people? Because as I alluded to earlier, by default, people will not build on the right platform. You know, there are so many different actors and, and people out there who are just trying to establish market share without actually thinking about, is it decentralized? Is it secure? Is it safe? Is it going to be better for players? And so that is what is truly important to us um, because otherwise it breaks in two years, it breaks in three years and you set the entire industry back a year like we saw over the past few months. What is like the biggest thing, and, and it sounds like maybe just security, but as you're talking to developers who, yeah. are, who want to get into the ecosystem, like what are you hearing the most from them? What are their biggest reservations? Yeah. Uh, security, scale, simplicity to build and volume, like are the, the ways I'd sum it up. And we really specifically target all of them. So uh, security, like infallible, right? Um, you can always withdraw to, to layer one on Ethereum via a smart contract where it's not even a bridge. There is, we, we completely inherit the security of Ethereum. Um, scale front, we're going from 10,000 TPS to like over half a million. And that's um, transactions per second. That's like the amount of transactions yeah. you can process. Yeah, precisely. Damn. Um, so Ethereum currently does three to five NFT transactions per second. We do over nine. That's why our gas fees are so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And there's hundreds of us trying to mint an NFT. Yeah, people are, of us. Are, are trading monkey JPEGs and <laughs> you can only do three per second. Um, but we, we already do 9,000 um, and with our recent cross roll up liquidity platform, which we announced uh, about a month ago, we'll be able to basically parallelize that infinitely without any compromises. Um, so not infinitely from day one, but, but certainly to sort of like hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. And the reason that's necessary is if you try and put World of Warcraft and Fortnite on like any layer two today, it breaks. Even 10,000 TPS is not enough. And so we need this ability to build dedicated scaling while not siloing any of those users trades or liquidity and that's what we specialize in mm -hmm. i heard you say at one point that like the metric you care most about and you can correct me on this is like the time it takes for a developer to concept an idea and be like i want to build xyz game or something on ethereum to being able to deploy it and execute it on yeah. immutable x would you describe that as the most important metric for you not the global most important metric you know that's that's basically like how much volume we're we doing how many you know players are we helping um so the most important metric I would say is like 
how many unique traders do we have on Immutable? And our goal is obviously to get to billions. Um, and that means we've really, truly transformed multiple in industries to be sort of player owned first or user owned first. Um, but to your question earlier around that metric, that, that's what we think about when we think about developer experience, which is like, we need the stripe of Web3, right? We need it to be incredibly easy for any Web2 developer who has no idea what Solidity is, they don't want to touch it, it is terrifying to them to be able to build an incredibly secure and safe and awesome game for hundreds of millions of players. And that's what we we try and build. And you're doing that through like APIs and SDKs and Precisely. insert acronyms so here. So developers do not touch smart contracts when they build on Immutable. Mm. Uh, and, and this is powerful because it means that we can actually scale companies without even having to talk to them. Uh, so we just had recently Aglet, which is this you know in, uh, move to earn app um, and, and much more than that, who has literally, I think, almost a million users at the moment. And they've just built on us without even having to, to sort of like work with our developer team. Um, and that's the scale that means that we can work with thousands of businesses simultaneously like Stripe does um, without having to, to sort of hold them up in the process. What is like what is the the business structure? Because you have this game studio that's yeah. like building your own games, like Gods Unchained, which you did, and you've got uh, other games that are uh, native to to IMX. But then you're trying to bring developers on. How do you service all of that? Yeah. So we we have two, as you rightly identified, spokes to the business. We have the Immutable Game Studio, which is led by Justin Hulog, who ran a good. A portion of the world for Riot Games. Um, and that includes our titles like Gods Unchained and Guild of Guardians, uh, and also has sort of publishing relationships, um, which we're building out as a capability. And the whole goal there is to build like incredible Web3 games that empower players, and then use those IP from these games around economy design, around community building, around go to market and marketing and Web3, and turn that into playbooks that everyone on the Immutable X platform side can use for their games, so all of our partners. And the reason that's so meaningful is if you look at any new industry in the distribution of games, so when uh, social gaming along, uh, gaming came along with the advent of like Facebook and uh, uh, Zynga, um, when you look at the advent of mobile gaming and, and sort of king hits like Supercell, these distribution methods only became popular when one publisher came along figured out how to use it most effectively and then turn that into a playbook that everyone could use. You know, uh, Zynga reskinned Mafia Wars into 10 different games, including ones for like eight-year-old girls. And then they turned that model of here's how you use performance marketing and here's how you use distribution via the social graph of Facebook into a model that anyone could use to successfully make games. And that quickly became like the dominant form of game distribution over the next few years. Same thing happened with mobile. It took a few people to figure out, oh, cool, like we need a brand new model of gotcha game design or free-to-play game design uh, to make this stuff successful. And as soon as people did, there was an influx of people who knew how to make great games but just hadn't figured out this metagame design yet. The exact same thing needs to be done for Web3 and not just for gaming. It needs to be done for here's how you do a DAO successfully. Here's how you do a decentralized ride sharing app or a decentralized brand successfully. And we have templates and defaults for people to use so we can actually build this world at scale rather than you know, a, a few people building random scrappy experiments and then expecting everyone new to the industry to figure this stuff out by themselves. It has to be dead simple and it has to be built robust. Let's talk about the carbon narrative. Is mm. that is that how I should phrase that? I mean, I think, you know, we both work in this space and yep. probably on occasion, like talk to people who are not in this space. and there's such a negative perception yeah. uh, because of the the perceived environmental impacts. I don't know like how you feel about that writ large, but obviously IMX um, is doing a lot to combat that narrative by being a really carbon neutral it's train. really important, yeah. Explain that a little bit more to me, because I'm like kind of skeptical, to be honest. When I hear yeah. anybody out there being like, well, we're carbon neutral, I'm like, are you buying some carbon credit that's just like pegged to another tree that somebody Precisely. else is buying a carbon credit on? So Precisely. like, what do you think about that? I think you're exactly right. We should be skeptical any time someone says we're carbon neutral. I mean, that could mean a million different things. And there's like the, the price of carbon differs by an order of magnitude worldwide. And the quality of those offsets differs proportionately. So uh, it is a industry that is fraught. What I can say is that not only are we completely certified by three different independent partners, uh, but we actually don't use that much carbon. And that's really the point is 
we're not paying millions of dollars per year to some you know crappy company um to, to plant trees and who gods knows where or like to, for farmers to say we were going to use this land and now we're not going to even though they were never planning on it and then selling us those carbon credits um it is really fundamentally optimizing the usage of the settlement network and that is what is important in terms of establishing let me cut in and like yeah. kind of explain that because again i think people don't really do, uh, under understand l2s right now right which is all these transactions are happening on imx yeah. gas free yeah and, know, and none of that costs up. any more carbon than like storing an image on you know your iCloud in your iPhone like it's just service right because nobody's it's the, it's the mining piece it's the electricity that's used in the mining process that's like Precisely. super energy intensive yeah. and y'all don't have miners and you don't need the miners because yeah. and the miners bring the security because now you have thousands of people around the world validating what's happening on a network which is what brings that security to it and y'all don't need that because you're using ethereum for that so you're having all these transactions happen yep and then you're rolling them all up, you're batching them together, and you settle them on Ethereum. That's what you mean by that, that settlement layer piece. Precisely, and so think of it just as like a really advanced compression, a really advanced zip file where we take what would ordinarily cost huge amounts of gas and information to process, and we just upload that proof, exactly, into a, a tiny block on Ethereum. Um, and that's why we can be carbon neutral so easily, but like more than that, we're not having much of a carbon impact at all. So you're just trying to offset the, the energy that's being used by miners that you're then leveraging. Precisely. And this is why I think I, you know, and, and admittedly, I haven't dug deep, deep into the the energy side of things. Uh, it just doesn't, hasn't been where, like, my chief interest in mm. blockchain has lied. But part of it has also been, I'm like, well, I do believe we're moving to proof of stake. In fact, it, it looks like that's moving ahead, mm. hopefully this year. Like, and it kind of eliminates the problem for anybody who's centrally focused on Ethereum, which I am. Mm. Right? Like, am I crazy? <laughs> it, it, it leave it, it's a huge amount, right? You're, you're no longer having miners um, incentivized to, to burn electricity all around the world. Um, so with that, then it becomes even more carbon neutral. I, I think the most important thing you touched on, though, is that this has to be really loud and clear for, yeah. for mainstream people because it is one of the number one objections that we get to NFTs today from game devs. And it, it's part of the reason they choose us is they need someone who can be like, absolutely under the tightest level of scrutiny, um, carbon neutral. But it is incredibly important for this industry, even if like, and, and to all the listeners, even if you do not particularly care about sustainability, and there's very few of these people today, it is important to the adoption of Web3 and to the adoption of decentralization because we cannot leave anything to chance in terms of ejections. We've got to make this uh, as as palatable as possible for, for sort of um, companies to adopt and, and, and be used. Do you hear this from developers? Like, do you hear this from your partners where they're like, I'm not, I don't want to get on here. Or I'm really hesitant. It's because... table stakes. You you must be carbon neutral. Like, they will not, like people will not build on you otherwise. And is it, is it primarily brands or it's literally across the board? You hear it. So brands, a huge amount of pressure. Like if you're a consumer brand, there's no way that you can get away with this. Um, you'll just receive far too much flack. Um, those that do use sort of layer one directly are doing you know, various forms of offset schemes or, or, or whatever um, in order to make this viable. And I think it's much simpler to just not use much in the first place. Um, but even in games, it's really important too because their usage in terms of transaction, like volume is gonna be far higher than a PFP drop or some luxury art drop by Gucci or whatever. So. I'm such a noob to gaming. Like, I didn't grow up a gamer, and it's only because I'm so interested in blockchain. That's good you know the word noob, though. Yeah, okay. Sure That's, it yeah. comes from the game, from like yeah. gaming culture, right? Of course, yeah. So it's, it's fully seeped its way into my life, clearly. So there might be some weird ancient etymology. I don't know. But I think of it as a gaming term, yeah, too, because it, like, it was like the weird gamers, no offense, in my class who would yep. be like, you're a noob, you know? Um, so I don't know. I mean, why do you think this will be the Trojan horse that brings the masses into blockchain? I think it's because like a single hit game has more players than there are crypto users in total around the world today. Um, so when you look at it from a pure maths perspective, the likelihood that the next tripling of crypto wallets or crypto users comes from a hit game where it's under the hood and you don't even know you're using NFTs um, is, is to me to be certain. Like it's gonna take time for financial institutions to adopt things for, um, especially financial customers to adopt, you know, DeFi on the back end. even though we had, you know, the last batch of YC startups was effectively just providing UST yields to people with a, a, a sexy front end, um, which is, <laughs> there's all sorts of things wrong with that. But um, the, the main point is that 
this is the first consumer application that will truly get hundreds of millions of players. And it has real value that can be pointed to today, rather than a lot of the remaining value being sort of still being theoretically worked out, and especially on the user experience side. So I think it's very quick to build, and I think it's going to have massive audiences very fast. I've always said it was going to be ticketing. I'm like, it's my going yeah. to my Beyonce concert and yeah. that being an NFT. I'm a huge fan of ticketing, but I do think that when we look at like, where do people spend their time today? And what is the fastest growing user share uh, or mind share in terms of forms of entertainment? It is gaming by far. Gaming today is bigger than music, movies, and TV combined. And that's growing at 10% year on year. And would it be like, is it the younger cohort too in which you see like the most I I participation in games? It's so everything. as they get older? And you know, like, like some, some of the fastest growing segments in games of the last decade have been, you know, 40 to 60 year old mums mm. who are playing Candy Crush. Or like, or like Zynga, yeah. yeah. They're, playing, they're playing like Farmville or something. I mean, this is, this is how people are self-actualizing. I think the more deeply immersive or hardcore stuff is, is younger people, but this is truly like how people spend their time. Something that I've been fascinated and, and tracking a little bit in gaming because thanks to Justin Hulog, who is your head of game yep. studios, is just the geographic distribution of game players. And he was showing me some chart yesterday, 50% basically of the gaming market is in Asia mm. at, at this point. And I think it's interesting being in the United States, you know, what we've, or you're not in the United States, but I'm here and you know, you have this sort of Western centric view of games and what games are. And I think some of them lend themselves maybe less well to obvious blockchain one-to-ones like a Legend of Zelda. They don't have necessarily these robust economies. Yeah. And having, if you're here, having to get out of that mindset of like, well, this is what gaming is because actually the global gaming market looks so different than maybe the US Completely. gaming market that people yeah. who are 28 grew up I with. mean, how many people do you know who have played Genshin Impact or Final Fantasy religiously, like maybe more of the latter, but I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am not a gamer, so I know nobody's played any, either of those. Is the point is those are there are massive mass, like games. The, the that biggest revenue heroes. generating games in the world are uh, in Asia. And they're completely different genres to what like the West plays. So interesting. Are the the centers of power shifting, you think, when it comes to gaming? Like again, Justin and I were talking about this. It seems like the centers of power shifted when mobile gaming mm -hmm. came you know, into the four. Yep. And is that now happening again? Do you think we'll, it'll happen again with blockchain? I think we're still seeing massive growth in, in mobile gaming. Um, there's more to come there as like, tech becomes better and um, everything's put in your pocket. Like hardcore is now much less interesting um, and things are in general becoming far more live service model um, and, and sort of far more free to play. Um, what is interesting is that a lot of the Asian models are actually less focused on this idea of like fairness and they're more around creating game designs which incorporate this idea of you can be like the really powerful um, person by, by spending money. And a lot of that suits sort of the, the um, paradigms of true ownership and economies really well. And um, of course, the Western model does too because- Wait, there's an irony to like communist China, which I understand obviously it's like, capitalist with a Chinese characteristics or whatever, but like being the ones to be at the forefront of like the ownership economy in games. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether it would be China at the forefront of Okay, of Asia. Three. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I think I think probably with not. the Philippines. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So like, um, I mean, there are more uh, users with wallets in the rural Philippines than have bank accounts. Um, so I think there are huge opportunities for uh, play and earn or just sort of sort of true ownership models to take off in these countries, um, particularly in the types of game designs that are really popular there right now, um, around sort of gacha monetization or um, these heavy sort of um, power usage into games. And also there's no cultural backlash whatsoever in these countries around NFTs. So in the West, you have quite this this loud 10% who's saying, hey, we're, we're not a fan of this right now. And I think the solution God there is- NFTs. Did you see those? Yeah, ticketers? look, that's a, that's something I, I can't really empathize with. Um, but I, I do understand why people are having some of these reactions. And I think it's incumbent on us to actually show gamers why this is better. And we do that by getting them to install a game on their phone or computer that they don't know has crypto and they have a better time because of it. They can sell an asset that they you know otherwise spend. And we hear like, I talk to users of Gods Unchained and they say, I go back to Hearthstone and I look at the money I was spending on packs and I feel sick about the idea of spending money on these mm. packs again, on something I can't sell. And it's less about the idea of 10xing your money. It's more about the idea of just, do I have property rights? Can I sell this thing I've been buying? 
I'm so interested in this shift that will eventually come where we no longer see NFTs as a way to become super rich, but it can subsidize experiences. I think about this like in entertainment. I was talking to Micah Johnson, who's the creator of Aku and Akutars, and he was like, I have this vision of in the future m- releasing a film to like a million NFT holders mm. and, and that's who can watch it. And then and they pay 20 bucks or whatever to watch it like you would in a theater, mm. or, you know, when it's home release. And then they can sell that NFT to the next person maybe for, you know, maybe they don't make money on it. They sell it for 17 bucks or 15 bucks or yep. whatever, but it's now subsidized their their initial experience. It sounds like you're kind of getting at that with yeah, this. Yeah, like, I, I, I think so. Um, so that, that's an interesting model, certainly, which is like the the license to consume, um, which I think is, uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that takes off. Um, it's certainly a different value prop to sort of property rights over a good, but fundamentally it must take that. Like it, it must become people trade stuff because they want to trade it rather than getting rich and, and like point to houses, right? Like some people trade houses to get rich, most people just want a house to live in. Yeah, need a house to live in, and then luckily they own it as opposed to lighting their money on fire and it might, from it a might renting go down, model. And, and that's fine. Um, right. But the thing I'm most excited about is incentive alignment, is for the first time ever we have a model which can be driven by capitalist incentives, which is what we have right now, and it can be much better balanced for players. You can have incentive alignment between a publisher and between users. You can have a game that's owned by the players or a, a DAO that is community owned. And I think that is the key value prop of, of Web3 today. Not just true ownership, it is incentive alignment and coordination. And is it, it just hasn't taken off because we just haven't had a fun enough game. <laughs> game, no offense game to all. Time to build. I mean, sorry, God's Unchained. You know? No, I, absolutely. But it's it's a like these are the problems that we've got to solve, and that's what we're trying to solve with uh, God's Unchained and Guild of Guardians and all of the other games building on Immutable. And so, you know, uh, Alluvium, right? Yeah. They just did a massive land sale, seventy-two mil in a weekend on Immutable, um, and that was just twenty percent of the land. And the reason that they've been able to achieve those results is because they've been building this thing for two years and they've invested over nine figures in it and they have over 220 full-time employees working on it. So like good games take time, a ton of staff and big budgets to build well. And unlike a PFP, which you can pay clearly an Upworker to build over a weekend and then spin up a community, and sure the successful ones do a lot more than that. I'm not disparaging PFPs, but they're quick to build. There's nothing that's taking like 24 months there. It's a low barrier to entry. Precisely. So the stat I, I shared recently, I, I want to like highlight is eight billion dollars have been invested into Web three games in two thousand and twenty. The entirety of gaming investment, and that includes some of the Web three investments, was uh, just under, f- just over four billion dollars. So, so double the amount of money has been invested in blockchain games in the last year. It would be around the last eighteen months. Last majorly. eighteen months. Yeah. That was invested in all of gaming, yeah. not just Web three games. Yeah. In two thousand and twenty. Holy hell. Yeah. I think I heard Scott Galloway make a joke being like, if we threw this much money at a toaster, and he wasn't talking about games in particular, but he was talking about <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like just all the money that's gone yeah. into Web3 and why inevitably something will come out of it. And he's sort of a skeptic. But yeah. He's like, if we threw this much money at a toaster, like it would, you know, do something remarkable. It would, it would solve climate change. <laughs> yes, right? literally. So like, I, I completely agree. I think it's a forcing <laughs> function because there will be incredible content that's coming out of this stuff. Um, and also we're seeing brand new methods of monetization and game creation through Web3 that literally don't exist. Yeah. Um, so like, number one, we bring back the magic of, uh, when you trade physical Magic the Gathering cards uh-huh. as a child. I have played that. Awesome. Um, so you Fred. know like, the, a huge part of the experience is literally trading cards with your friends and like buying and selling. And the cool thing about that is it actually impacts the way people play the game. So some people might, for instance, buy one of the worst cards or the cheapest cards in the game build a really competitive deck that must use that card, popularize it, and then suddenly they've made money on their stash of this crappy card. And so you actually create meta incentives to sort of find undervalued game design principles. Mm. Um, or, or two, we have this idea of guilt, which is completely inverting the way that marketing is historically run for games. Historically, I pay Google $100 million and they show it to, you know, like 10 billion impressions. and that's giving all of that value to ads, and then I have to extract that value from players. Now we can literally have guilds who have an incentive to find the most exciting, na- like nascent content, and discover it, buy up some of the tokens, and then popularize it, or like showcase why it's going to be meaningful. So you've literally created market incentives to sort of price what content is valuable. Uh, or we have, you know, a, a website built on Gods Unchained, a, a third-party deck website, has made over seven figures by being the place where people want to find the decks they want to use in the game, and then they just add a link to buy those cards on that website. So like the emergence of businesses 
based on the open standards of NFTs um, is really powerful for the future of gaming. And we've seen the most successful companies the past couple of decades have all been like, how do we allow users to create the value, not us? Mm -hmm. And we just organize it. You said something, and I want you to like clarify it for me because I don't know if I properly understood it the first time I heard you say it, which was around basically user-generated content and how ubiquitous that's becoming Mm. to the point that it may that's a commodity, right? Like yeah. the, the ability to build a game, even maybe a fun game, like the, the, that barrier to entry is actually yeah. getting lower as you have more UGC. Um, and how that changes like the needs of some, like what IMX needs to be, almost more of a, a curator and, yeah. and a platform that can funnel the best to the top as opposed to like, you know, just developing things. Yeah. Am I summarizing that right? Or like, is that, are you kind yeah, of imagining I, I, I something like accurately. that in the future? So I think the, the general um, thesis is that like, stuff is gonna keep becoming cheaper to make, whether it's a video game, a movie, uh, you know, a, an item inside any of these, a, a mod. And what is gonna be the most important thing is build the system by which people can find the best stuff. Mm. And if you look at throughout history, like, we saw the advent of the internet, which created almost infinite supply and infinite distribution of content for the first time in history. And the companies that created the most value were the companies that organized value. So search organized all of that content into what you wanted to find. Facebook organized the world's social graph into your friends and the content that you wanted to see. And so what Web3 is doing is at a layer deeper, creating market incentives for content to rise to the top, the mm. assets that people love for the best business principles or the the, the fairest down implementation of a business which gives the most value away to the community to become the most successful one. Um, and so that's the reason I'm so excited about this for, for gaming is we're gonna see brand new game design models like imagine Roblox where anyone can create assets and all of those assets can be priced at market value and, and be discovered. Um, that's a world where we're truly incentivizing the creativity of like a billion people. Does this change the dynamic between like game developers and game studios? And I want to give like a context there, which is Mm. I recently talked to Koopa Troopa, you know, who's like music NFT man and and such an expert on on all of that. And, you know, he was postulating about like the cost per stream is going to go to zero, like in music, like streams already, you as an artist, you make so little on streams, that's basically going to go to nothing. And the way artists will make money is monetizing their super fans. And, you know, we can all we can talk all about the creator economy. In like the game developer world, it feels like traditional gaming world, these AAA studios have all the power. Indie game developers like really struggle to like break in compared to the power of these AAA studios. Does that change in Web3 where these like smaller developers have a chance to really break through and almost monetize directly the way other creators do? It does. So the reason I think it does is because what Web3 is doing is giving indie developers the power to have enormous marketing budgets and enormous incentives for people to adopt these games without actually having those resources. The game still has to be good, but now you can take some of the assets of your game and literally give it out to the players of your game is effectively equity ownership. Blizzard's never going to do this. And if they do do it, it's going to be much higher like entrance than it is for these games. And so you can actually solve the S-curve adoption or like the early network effects required for a game to become successful through Web3, uh, which we know through, you know, sort of the, the token incentives that have popularized um, among DeFi. The thing here is there's actually reasons to stick around. People aren't just yield farming and like dumping in TVL and then ripping it out the next day. They're playing a game, they're loving it, and they're coming back and they're building a community. So we're seeing real traction rather than just incentivized adoption for a short period of time. You're saying Blizzard will never do it. This is a big question that me... So in that context, I think Blizzard will never create an entrance price that is like going to be super interesting for people to be like, wow, I really want to make this super popular, right? Like they're already going to have the resource to do this. What this does do is it give indie games and mid-market games the same playing field or the ability to get Where to they're going to crowdfund stage. something which gives more power to the, the yeah. community that's building it with them, whereas Blizzard has the resources. Precisely. But, but I'm so, like, I don't yet feel like I have a perspective on will all games ultimately be on-chain and have an on-chain element or will this be, like not all games are mobile. Yeah. Or will this be a more like mobile where it's a growing and maybe massive subsector of the overall gaming world? Yeah. 
Or is there like that you, you talk about your friend who's like, ah, oh, I'm sick at all the money I spent on packs in this other game. Like, will yeah. we hit a point where nobody can fathom Look, not owning their anything Up, up until game? it's decommissioned, some people still use Internet Explorer. So like, <laughs> I, but some people, people still use AOL. <laughs> precisely. So people, there, there absolutely will be different things. I don't think it's going to be a genre thing. So I don't think it's going to be like, this is just a, a specific 10% genre of games. Of course, these games have to be multiplayer. Otherwise, there's no reason having ownership over stuff that you can't trade or don't ever want to trade but the vast majority of games what it's going to become is it's going to become an expectation by players and that's when we know we've done our job when digital property rights are not something we have to explain to people they are innately when a kid grows up and they're five and they start playing a game and they're able to own stuff that's just the way they conceptualize of ownership in the same way that if i sell you a bottle of water or if i sell you a record you can go and sell that to anyone else and that's what we're really Feel, like philosophically trying to change about consumer expectations. Mm. You mentioned you mentioned Alluvium, which I, I always hear is sort of like the AAA game studio yeah. of of Web three. Though I'm like, sick. I feel very hesitant to call anything a AAA game studio at sure. this point. It's like blue chip NFTs. I'm like, nothing's a blue chip yet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let's give it at least a year. I think if you, but, but I think in their defense, if you go by budget, okay. and if you go by the style of game they're building, they very much fulfill the definition okay. of a AAA game. Okay, so you have to explain this to me because I am relatively speaking, somewhat anti-land sale. Yeah. And you mentioned Roblox, and to me the power of Roblox is the UGC, is the yeah. fact that anyone can go and build on it, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you build the network effects, and it feels like land sales immediately set up a weird dynamic. Yeah. And and you're also incentivized as a game, you know, as the game maker to like, you know, reward people who had the money in the beginning rather than people who are building the most or, or, or yeah. giving the most to the ecosystem. I don't know. What do you, how do you? No, feel about it's it's that? a really good point, and I think you touch on very important principles. So I think a, a couple of them are very close to my heart, which is that these games should be completely accessible. Like they must be free to play, to earn, and <laughs> right, and, and, and that's so important. Like you can't have a game where you have to buy, you know, three axes for hundred bucks, and they change that, right? Um, otherwise you have barriers to entry that are insane. Um, I think in the in the case of the Alluvium land sale, you know, the really differentiating thing about Alluvium is a hundred percent of all of their revenue goes to ILV. So really, like everything Wait, they're doing, say it slower. 100% of their revenue goes to ILV. No, I still don't know what ILV is. What is ILV? <laughs> so the the radical thing about Alluvium, it is in, it's entirely- Oh, ILV is their token. Yeah, Alluvium yeah. token, ILV. Okay. So every I would think like total cent. locked volume, no, but yeah. I, okay. Um, so every cent that's made by them goes to all token holders of Alluvium. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And that is, I think, why their decisions have to come from a community perspective. And having known the team, I know that the first time they think about any single decision they make is what will the community react? What is in the best interest of the community and ILV holders? I don't want to make you like badmouth anybody else, but do you think that's part of where like an Axie, for example, has gone wrong? Like, you know, and, and, I think Axie could have all sorts of resurgences and they have Axie Origin that just came out. Yep. This is not to yep. badmouth anybody by any means, but clearly they've had a little bit of a fall from grace from their their highs. I'm yep. curious like what your assessment of that is. So first, obviously enormous respect for Axie totally. and what they pioneered. Um, the, the flaw with Axie is just their economics. It's not sustainable. Uh, and so that's actually, when we focus on the studio side, it's how do we generate that kind of growth at a sustainable pace? Um, I, can, I can go into the details, but the fundamental principles are actually very simple, which is that if you inflate supply, via creating an NFT or giving out a fungible token, the impact on user behavior must pay for that inflated supply. If you're increasing retention or viral acquisition or the amount a user wants to spend in the economy, that must pay for that supply inflation. Otherwise, you're creating without it being backed. And as long as you follow that very, very simple principle, which is obviously lots of work beyond that, you're creating an economy that can sustain even the fastest possible growth. And Axie understands that, right? Like we, we can, you know, I think, the, the simplified version of that of like if the game isn't fundamentally fun to play and yep. people are just in it to extract ultimately that math doesn't math because you can't just have extraction yep. extraction you have to have Precisely. inputs yep. um, and I, I do think they understand that and they're working to try and build their uh, fun game call it and they have their versions now where you can have free axes so they yep. can get more people onto it and and all the rest of it um, with somebody like Alluvium like what how does that pitch go how do they end up on IMX how did that partnership come together? Yeah, uh, we met the uh, Alluvium team really early on. Uh, obviously, they're, they're Sydney based. Um, and we, we were actually even chatting about like the ideation stage um, way, way back in the day. And then as they started building, um, it became pretty clear how significant this was going to be. Um, and we basically, you know, th they wanted to make a choice around user security that would 
they never wanted to undermine the security of their users' assets. Um, they also wanted a choice that would be uh, scalable for the kind of game that they're building. Um, and you know, even with the land sale, like they're creating you know, nearly 100,000 assets, right? Or literally 100,000. So that is in itself a, a reasonably high volume. Um, but then with the broader game, they're gonna be minting like millions uh, as, they, as they start to build this sort of like UGC economies. Um, and then the final thing is I think they really wanted a solution that uh, would be sort of technically sound through everything from, they, they commented on the, the disaster of um, the other side mint. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they, they, this stuff is really important. Like, you, it's it's 2022. You should not be doing um, a, a terrible gas burning mint. Like, that, that thing burns. Also, when you've already KYC, like, you have a sense of how many people are coming in. Again, not trying to badmouth people, yeah. but I do comment on this stuff because this is my job now, apparently. Yeah. And um, it does feel like that there are ways to avoid that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting when you talk about, obviously, the security piece comes up again and again. Like, does Alluvium or, or any of these people that you're talking about, like how much of it is we're super sophisticated and mm. we really understand security and why Ethereum has yeah. sort of created well, security look, and how much is like, we trust Robbie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I, I, and I, I wanted to talk about your earlier point because it's great that people trust me. I hope that they do. But the important thing is you shouldn't. You should verify everything that I say. And... You know, I'm, I'm accurate when I talk about other L2s and, and how they also similarly in, inherit or don't inherit Ethereum security. And, and the most important thing is that we can verify this stuff. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, 99% of people will never look at it. And so we have to create brands and we have to create success that can be instantly identified with, cool, there's a green lock on my browser. I know my website is secure. They don't need to know how sort of end-to-end -end encryption works. Um, and we need to create these brands and, and success for actually like secure solutions in um, Web3. Um, the final thing I'll touch on is they just wanted a solution that would generate the right level of volume and liquidity for, for their assets. And I think like our global order book is a really strong offering for games because it means they can have their own in-game sales. So awesome. You just earn an alluvial in the overworld and you sort of want to use it or you want to so sell it. Le let's like not just gloss over this. Let's yeah. like do this. Yeah. NFT liquidity. I feel like people obviously roughly understand liquidity, like board apes are super yep. liquid because they're a popular thing. And so you're able to buy and sell them. But I feel like there's something bigger here when you say NFT liquidity, it's like yep. this central thing. Can you define what you really mean by that? Look, ultimately there's gonna be a huge amount of scaling solutions coming out over the next two years. Um, my, my strong belief is that Starkware is clearly the market leader in, in sort of um, fundamental ZK tech. What our job is, is to make sure that we build the best possible user experience and the best possible volume for this stuff. If you come to us, you should get more volume than anywhere else. Um, and that's what we're obsessed with in, in every way, building for every application that's going to use NFTs. And so when you look at the way that NFTs are going to be traded, the best place to trade a gaming item or to sell a gaming item is going to be inside the game where you receive it. And the best place to buy is often going to be on NFT aggregator or where like power users are, or maybe on a deck building website, but it'll be in multi sort of contextual applications. And what our global order book does is it literally connects the trades or the buyers and sellers, no matter where they trade. So someone can be in Alluvium overworld, they're just captured an Alluvial and they want to sell it for 10 bucks. And they can do that listing inside the game. Just click a button and that will immediately propagate to every single marketplace that uses Immutable from, you know, Rarible, Token Trove, GameStop, OpenSea. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's an incredible thing for folks to realize. That was like an unlock moment for me when I understood what you guys were doing there. Are other LZUs doing that? Um, as far as I or know, it's this, a is point a, of this is a point of distinction. Yeah, this is a big X. differentiate. This is what we're really focused on, right? We'd, and, and this differentiates us from blockchains. Um, at the end of the day, is like obviously we compete with blockchains in deals like Solana and and you know, the other big L ones or side chains, but the main point of differentiation we have is we're much more than just a blockchain. Um, we're obviously a set of advisory tools and, and, and services for games, but we're also this connective tissue between any buyer and seller of any asset. And I think that's gonna be one of the most important things over the next decade as we build out this entire like layer of tokenization over stuff from gaming to finance to uh, ownership of real stuff like houses or shoes. Does this get into like cross roll up liquidity because my my feeling is like you're it's not just about having liquidity within IMX for what y'all are trying to build but it's like there's a broader eco, broader ecosystem you're you're playing into precisely Can like, you like the, explain this <laughs> so the number one problem with scaling today and 
why we literally even have these debates around this blockchain or this one is that there is a trade-off every time you use a new scaling solution. You lose users, wallets, trades, and orders. All of this stuff has to be started from scratch. And so you lose the ecosystem benefits that make one preferable in the first place. The problem though is it's very, very hard to scale like any monolithic instance, even if it's a single L2, to the heights that we need in order to power like a world of NFTs being traded in a decade. And and you know, feasibly it's a billion users. And they're trading stuff from gaming assets to finance to insurance options to houses to title to IP and music to their private data for Facebook or medical data that they're selling. Like this is how we store unique value and trade it. There's gonna be trillions of these traded. And that requires significant throughput. What our cross roll up liquidity solution has done is we can create multiple L2s and even L3s. So creating roll ups that roll up to an L2 as a settlement layer and then roll up to L1. And all of those can have unified liquidity. So we're not compromising on anything. Um, basically the first, you know, kind of, uh, attempt at this and and the reason i'm really excited you know vitalik has talked about this um for a long time and what this will do is allow us to spin up dedicated scaling instances even with different trade-offs say like you want slightly high security or or, or whatever um, based on your needs and have all of that still share the network effects with everyone else um, and this is what truly creates like the powerhouse of content on ethereum so this is huge and i and i have now done enough spent enough time trying to understand this stuff i think to to kind of grasp why this is a feels really big and why it makes me very bullish on Ethereum. But let me try and break it down and, and tell me if I have it roughly correct here, which is you mentioned like even a monolithic L2 can't do this. What you're, you're getting at is we need to have millions of transactions. You're referencing like medical records, like all the things that we're going to eventually want to have on chain. And yeah. it's like a, a shit ton of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And no one single chain is likely to be able to scale or you know it's, it's very hard to ask one single chain to yep. scale to the point to handle all of that yeah or, or a single l2 instance correct so yeah. a single imx like you know imx one yep. chain or you know one you're right it's not chain right but like one alone yep. is, is probably it's very hard to do that so lana which you know people like because again it has more tps it has more transactions yep. that you can do than an ethereum but but so one solana chain alone like that's going to be very hard for, yep. for solana to do and we can get into why Ethereum is better poised for this because of the decentralization piece. So that's going to be very hard for, for any one thing to do. Um, and so, and yet what you want, if, if you have multiple chains or you have multiple instances of an L2, what you lose is the fact that like this easy liquidity where it's easy to trade mm. between them. That's what you're trying to really solve for mm. here, which is saying, okay, we are setting up the system and the, the capacity for lots of different instances of L2s to be built. And I think that's also fascinating because L2s, the, the, the t you can fork it pretty easily, right? Like, and this gets into why does IMX have a competitive advantage even in theory? And we can yeah. talk about that. And, and, and not, look, not, not today. I think it's pretty hard to build this stuff, but it absolutely. And, you know, in five years, this stuff is going to be um, like, th there'll be huge amounts of, of different scaling solutions. And um, there'll be, I think, serious advantages to, to um, the right ones. But ultimately what we think is most important is how can we create the platform by which we can cater to the demand while also not compromising on yeah. a single thing. And and this will allow Ethereum to scale tremendously while you know, Ethereum- the Theoretically to millions of TPS. And, and while letting Ethereum do what Ethereum does best, which is the security piece. Precisely. And the network effect piece. You know, there's like hundreds of billions of dollars of ETH in people's pockets ready to be spent on digital stuff. And we don't lose that if we do this. And that is what mag is magnificent about this, is we're scaling to countless new businesses while all of them add network effects to every single other partner on the mutual network. And that is what I'm, I'm like really stoked about. And what's more is network effects on Ethereum specifically also lead to greater security because the more people you have coming on, the, yep. high, the more people you're more ultimately going to have running nodes, and that adds to the security of Ethereum. Precisely, yeah. I feel like we have to, and, and, just, and, and, and try to do this here of... This is getting into the modular blockchain theory. Yep. And I think what you have here is you have this trilemma. You have security, yep. decentralization, and scalability. And you're trying to get all three of these things yep. to happen. And you have chains like Solana that are compromising the decentralization piece of this yep. for the other two. And and you have something like Ethereum, which is strong in the decentralization piece and is now trying to almost um, 
<laughs> delegate out <laughs> yeah. the other two pieces. And that's where you get into modular. So you're making these three key pieces modular by having them handled in different ways. Precisely. The settlement layer is handling really? security. You can understand this stuff and it's so hard to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the important thing is that like it is not you get 10 skill points to spend on the scalability trilemma and <laughs> you know Solana is to spend them all on scale like ZK rollups just have way more skill points than everyone else it's a much better solution it solves the trilemma in a better way and with the introduction of this cross rollup liquidity platform what we're fundamentally solving for is like scale at infinite distance while maintaining volume users and wallets along every single stage. So when you know uh, World of Warcraft or when Fortnite comes on board, suddenly all of those users, those hundreds of millions of wallets, are ready to spend that money on any other game on L2, or to trade and buy assets from any other L2 scaling instance without a single loss of security, or without a single loss in liquidity and connectivity. And this is why, to get to where we started on all of this, you're quite bullish on Ethereum and thinks think we'll probably end up with like Ethereum dominant because it's like why we don't have a whole bunch of Twitters, <laughs> you know, in, in many ways. The network effects are there. And I mean, we have truth, right? But <laughs> yes. but um, if the network effects become strong enough in one place, it inevitably yeah. just And Ethereum dominant. is not opinionated about any No, it's, it's a protocol. It's precisely. not a platform. So we're not going to even see the balkanization that you see with right-wing alternatives to social media, right. which have different policy implementations. There is the, the policy implementation is very clear and it's very unopinionated about anything other than what the protocol does. But like I can, if I have a Gmail account and you have an AOL account, we can still email each other. Precisely. You know, it's not, yeah. I'm not, I don't have to be all on yeah. Gmail to communicate with somebody on, on, on Gmail. Yeah. All right, let's end here with a recent announcement from y'all around this $500 million fund you'll be deploying to work with developers and, yeah. and others. Like, talk to me about it. Yeah, so I think the goal is we have really strong opinions around where the future of successful Web3 gaming content is going to come from. Um, and we don't know what will be a hit, but we do know that you've got to hit to some policies, which is you've got to make it great for players. You've got to make the economy sustainable. You've got to have it be on secure infrastructure. And so the goal is really try and stoke the immutable ecosystem with hit games and hit content um, through this this $500 million fund. Um, and we're collaborating with uh, a, a few key funds on this as well, like, you know, Bitcraft, who's one of the, the leading gaming investors um, worldwide. So pretty thrilled about this. Um, you can apply today to anyone listening. Um, so please do. And uh, I hope it helps bring on board the next, you know, 10 high quality 100 million player games in the next 24 months. Awesome. Well, this is great. And again, we're going to do a couple more of these at least. Talk to some other people in the IMX ecosystem. Yep. I'm grateful because truly I've just wanted to, I wanted an excuse to talk and understand this all better. So thank you to you to letting me kind of come no, on awesome. and uh, yeah. be the, the dumb person who picks your brain, picks the brain of people in your ecosystem. Yeah. Because I think it is essential that people understand this and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But yeah. like, if you're betting on Ethereum, like this is what you're betting on. Yeah. It doesn't have to be IMX in particular, but like layer twos. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, I, anything that is uh, aligned with our philosophy, I'm, I'm supportive of. Obviously, I'm, I'm here to make uh, Immutable um, the, the default platform for gaming, but I philosophically, I, I have no opposition to other LTs. We're so early that it all just helps everything. You know, it's like all the jewelers being on the same block. You know, yeah. it just like brings more energy into the ecosystem. Yeah. Well, th there is no competition between blockchain games today. Like that is yeah. crazy because we're all competing with, you know, Call of Duty uh, doing yeah. the, the second version of Warzone and taking all of your content and titles and, and earnings just away and because they make money do that. So where they're competing with giant games companies who are ripping off players or, or not doing a model that is truly player first. Um, and that's what we're here to build and show to them that they can actually have a great business while using these methodologies. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, lots more to get into. Again, we'll, we'll come back and talk to some specific folks within, within y'all's ecosystem. Yep. And we'll be back here again at some point for me to just ask you dumb questions. Awesome. Thanks, Carly. <laughs> Thanks, Robbie.